Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Kramer. I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Bean Commission. And today I have the uh, privilege of moderating to the best of my ability this uh, virtual field day. Michigan State University has um, brought a great group together uh, to talk to us today about uh, dry bean production and sugar beet production. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for question and answers uh, throughout the session uh, at the conclusion of each presentation. And if you would, just please type your question in uh, the chat box and we'll be able to field those as best we can at the end of each presentation. Um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and just get started with our first presentation. Uh, Dr. Vicki Maroon is gonna focus on organic dry bean production and she'll be sharing her screen with us uh, immediately. So Vicki. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Today, I'm going to share specifically on organic bean production. But note that there is a video that is supplemental to this that you can review if you are interested in specifics about organic certification. And that link will be shared along with the other information that's uh, the recording of the today as well as other information from other speakers. And I am working very hard to advance my slide. There we go. So I wonder, do you know how to grow dry beans? Do you know how to grow organic dry beans? You say, well, what is the difference from growing conventional dry beans and organic dry beans? This morning, I'll try to shed some light on the subject and give a perspective of organic production using dry beans as an example. Michigan is number two in the US to grow dry beans, growing 17% of the nation's harvest, and we are number one in dry black bean production. We have good soil, the right day length, and our lakes provide moderating temperatures to allow a full season of bean production. Beans average about 105 days from seed to harvest. Once production of beans is, uh, is established, uh, it requires a whole system approach to uh, produce it from, from the bean seed variety to how the bean is harvested. Each piece is important to, to provide attention to detail and assure that all pieces are in place. Combining all these factors together offers a healthy organic crop. Organic production is dependent on each piece of management collectively. Timing and knowledge are critical to make all of this work. All ag production, regardless of organic, conventional, whatever uh, approach is, is used, requires knowledge and timing. But the greatest challenge in organic production is managing weeds as there's no herbicides available to provide that, that's that management approach. This innovation is essential and tools such as crimpers and cover crops help bring a bountiful organic harvest and are critical tools to managing weeds. Each piece of the puzzle must be carefully selected and put into practice with respect to crop production, economics, and the environment. For example, bean variety is important to select for not only resistance to a specific disease, but favorable for the market. Organic seed cannot be GMO, genetically modified type seed, which is not an issue for beans, as there's no GMO seeds, but organic seed must be treated with a chemical pesticide. Organic seed must, I'm sorry, must not be treated with a, 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 a chemical pesticide. And it's preferred that the organic, the seed is organic, raised and uh, certified with that NOP and go to green label that you see. And if it is not organically raised, it must be untreated, non-GMO, and shown that you tried to find organic. Plant growth is critical, of course, for good yield. But in this case, with beans, you don't want the plant itself too large to the point where good air circulation is not possible. Air circulation reduces diseases such as white mold, which white mold is one of the top 
challenges with growing dry bean in Michigan. Um, in terms of weed management, tools must be selected carefully as it depends on the size of the crop of which tool that you can use to manage the weeds, to, to remove their weeds from the field. Um, of course, you have to pay attention to the size of the weeds. They can't be too large and the soil moisture. So there's many factors that go into play that must be considered prior to uh, selecting the tool to manage the weeds. Weeding, of course, must destroy the weeds, but not destroy the crop in the process. And this is an issue with some uh, less experienced and maybe poorly adjusted mechanical tools to remove the weeds. So we want to promote opportunity, include all of these pieces or these implements essential to sound organic production, such as promoting biological controls, like this ladybird beetle you see here in the picture feeding on aphids. Good management and careful use of pesticides are critical, sorry, to, <clears throat> are, are, are a critical piece to the, to the puzzle of, of production. We'd, uh, field beans are planted typically between May 15th and June, mid June, late June in Michigan, depending on the weather and the soil moisture. And oftentimes, uh, organic farmers will wait a bit to make sure the soil is warm enough for quick germination. The faster you can get germination, the faster it's established, and the faster it can compete with weeds. Cover crops in the spring need to be turned in prior to field pre preparation. That is, if they haven't winter killed, like uh, uh, oats would winter kill. Or and the field needs to be cultivated to break up clods of soil to ensure good seed to soil contact. Some organic farmers practices no-till in some crops such as wheat. It's a challenge in organic because no-till um, often relies on an herbicide. Cover crops that act as a mulch can aid in weed management such as a, a cereal rye is often used and then can be crimped or uh, mowed and allowed to lay on the soil for a mulch. However, all measures need to be taken, not just one, to maximize bean seed germination. The faster the seed comes up, the sooner the crop can attain enough canopy to outcompete weeds and even some insect feeding. Black bean, of all the types of dry bean, is the most common grown by organic farmers. It's why you ask, this bean is easiest to grow and harvest. The seed germinates quickly and gains good growth to provide some weed competition. The shorter duration means it matures quicker, grows faster, so is less vulnerable to pest attack. Its uprightness makes it easier for, for harvest as well as to keep the, keep the foliage off of the ground so it's less prone to uh, disease, diseases like white mold. So here you see uh, a, a row cultivator, which is typically your first step um, in uh, pr preparation of the soil of some sort. This is just one type. There are many types out there and it depends on your soil type, on your tractor equipment and on your, um, your overall management practices. And I kind of did a survey with some organic farmers in Michigan. Um, this is not a formal survey, but it, it pretty much shows the, the typical practices. So the, you have a row cultivator and that's done two or three times over the soil, breaking up the clods, preparing the soil, followed by a rotary hoe. And that's typically done once. And you can see how it doesn't dig deep into the soil, but it helps to break the um, any clod, little small clods left, but it also provides quick weeding. And that's the glory of it. Um, it's maybe not uh, as, uh, it doesn't do as close to the crop as one would like, but it, it's quick and it can, and does not, like I mentioned, dig quick deep into the soil. Another tool sometimes is used as a propane weeder and that's occasionally used, but it must be done of course before bean germination. There's a new tool out there that relies on uh, LP gas and that's a, an electric string, if you will, that would, uh, so when the weeds are higher than the plant, you can use that. So you can see these tools are not for all the time or any time. Thus, um, you realize you need more than one tool available for uh, weeding. And then 
The last tool is the tine weeder, and that's, it can be this small or very large, depending on your acreage and your equipment to pull. And that is nice that it gets very close to the uh, plants. It goes over the plant. So obviously if you're taking a piece of metal over a plant, you need to go slow. Um, you'll, you'll, you will lose some plants, but um, you always compensate for that in your uh, seeding, allowing more seed than um, you anticipate will survive. And then <clears throat> the beans that are typically grown by organic growers are black bean, navy bean, white kidney, and you see these varieties. And zenith is a newer variety that is, um, has anthracnose resistance as well as a little bit of some white mold resistance. Uh, and it's, these are the two varieties that are typically grown by, I'd say, 90% of the organic farmers here in Michigan. And uh, like I mentioned, black bean is the perfect entry point for growing dry bean, or if you're just not able to uh, manage other, other, you've had other problems in the past, black bean is your bean of choice. It, if it has to sit in the field because of bad weather, it doesn't stain the seed coat like it would with a lighter color bean like white kidney or navy. And it uh, stays upright, doesn't lodge, so it's easier for um, harvest. Planting organic dry beans is typically done on wider rows between 22 and 30 inches and then drilled into moisture. This wider space provides an opportunity for air circulation um, in the plants to dry them out during periods of high humidity and rainfall. This disease, white mold, is probably the greatest disease problem in dry beans in the Midwest. When the weather occurs in the disease's favor, such as cooler temperatures, like we're experiencing this week, with moisture or rainfall. And we had, in the thumb, we had some rain last week. So the thumb is the primary area where organic beans are grown. Uh, Infection occurs during the bean flowering, but sadly, through scouting, it cannot be detected until much later. So detection is not the uh, approach used for management, but you need to monitor the weather and observing uh, even for the mushrooms, which is part of the life cycle of this disease. So it takes lots of knowledge of the, of the disease cycle, of monitoring the weather, and this monitoring the weather, we have our Enviro weather. I hope everybody is experienced with that. It's a wonderful tool. Um, there's a spore count tool that I understand that our bean team is assessing for dry, uh, for white mold for dry bean, and uh, that's a lovely app on your on your phone that looks at weather as well as uh, helps you to predict spore count. Reduced tillage will reduce spores as they lie, as the spores lie on the soil surface and they are vulnerable to the elements. If you do lots of tillage, you've incorporated those uh, spores so that they're protected within the soil and they can remain viable for up to five years. So you can see so many aspects to consider just for one specific disease. Adequate control of white mold and organic bean can be achieved by using a whole system approach. That is including multiple and cultural practices such as selection of less susceptible bean varieties, reduced cultivation, wide rows, 20 to 30 inches, and of course, crop rotation with non hosts of white mold. Managing nitrogen is important so the canopy is not too dense, which inhibits air circulation. There are fungicides available to organic growers that are reasonably effective, such as double nickel 155 and badge X2. A co they're uh, they're, uh, which is a copper-based fungicide, bactericide. Both of them offer about 80% control. Um, this is a report from Cornell from Pethridge in 2016. So this is a prime example of whole system approach to manage the disease from seed selection to planting to monitoring the crop weekly. And this is what you do not want in your soil. This is an example of what white mold looks like on a bean seed. And so with a whole system approach, you can manage, I didn't say control 100%, but manage this and uh, get a better, much better crop. Part of the whole system approach is crop rotation. So you want to include rotations that are not hosts to this white mold or sclerotinia. 
And as you see, we have corn followed by dry bean and it can be any of the varieties, types of dry bean that we typically grow in Michigan. And then a grass or small grain as the grass of small grain and corn are not hosts to sclerotinia. So are you ready to transition organic? Do you have the essential knowledge for building your soil, planting the right crop variety and selecting the rotations that will support your crops and managing pests smartly, not just a treating, but managing through scouting and assessment. And with that, you can get a healthy organic production or any type of uh, health uh, crop production would be healthy with using these approaches. So now you can look into organic certification, watch that video I have, I'm sharing, uh, identify a market, which is critical to any time you're doing a new approach, a new crop, a new system, and consider how you will store your crop through uh, following the, your harvest. So take advantage of these field days like today, farmers meetings and social and learning events that offer you a chance to ask questions and learn from others. Prob all surveys, you read them, where, how do you learn? And it's farmers. Farmers learn from the best uh, way to possibly uh, share each other's knowledge. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of this morning. Thank you, Vicki. Appreciate your comments. Uh, again, if anyone has any questions, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat box and <clears throat> we'll, be able to, we'll be able to ask those for you. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to watch for that, but while we do, we'll transition right into Dr. Francisco Gomez. Uh, Dr. Gomez joined MSU staff recently, replacing uh, Dr. Jim Kelly, and we're sure happy to have him on board. Uh, Dr. Gomez, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, my name is Francisco Gomez. I'm an assistant professor and dry bean breeder here at Michigan State University. I'd like to welcome everyone for the dry bean breeding and virtual field day tour. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank everyone, uh, all the organizers that organize this virtual event. So the Michigan State Dry Bean Breeding Program is a variety development breeding program. Our goal is to develop improved varieties of dry beans uh, for 10 commercial market classes of dry beans to serve uh, Michigan growers, Michigan producers, as well as the dry bean industry here in Michigan. Our primary focus is to develop high yielding varieties with disease resistance, stress resilience, as well as improved canning quality for 10 commercial market classes of dry bean for production here in Michigan. So today I'm actually standing here in Saginaw Valley Research and Extension Center where we do the bulk of our dry bean breeding program. Our second location is located in Montcalm Research Center. where we Primarily in that location we focus mostly on kidney beans. So one of the advantages of having these two locations for our, having our dry bean nurseries is that we can continuously make selections on our varieties and continuously adapt these varieties to the changing climate here in Michigan. And they're adapted to specific target environments for dry bean production here in Michigan. So the Michigan State Dry Bean Breeding Program is also conducting a yield trials for all 10 market classes of, uh, of dry bean in these two locations. So we're also participating in evaluating national trials, including the Dry Bean Cooperative Nursery, the Midwestern Regional Performance Nursery, the National Drought Nursery, as well as the National Sclerotinia Nursery. So one of these advantages of having these nurseries and participating in and evaluating these nurseries is that these are uh, collaborative efforts we have with other dry bean breeding programs in the U.S. And one of the advantages is that we can actually evaluate lines from our colleagues from other universities and look at them under Michigan environments. As well as this goes both ways, so they can evaluate our varieties in other environments across the U.S. and see how well they perform in other environments across the U.S. Another advantage is that we can actually evaluate lines from our, our, our collaborators and we can look at these lines and we can con consider them as using for our, our parental in our breeding program as well. So the Michigan State Dry Bean Breeding Program, uh, with the efforts of my predecessor, Dr. Jim Kelly, recently released four varieties of dry bean. These varieties include a black bean called Adams, a pinto bean called Charo, a, white, a great northern bean called Iger, and a yellow bean called Yellowstone. While these varieties that I just mentioned have recently been released from our breeding pipeline, they're currently under seed production out west. I would like to share some of their attributes with you. 
For the black bean atoms, it is a good yielder and significantly out yielded all other black bean varieties including Zenith, Zorro, Black Bear and Eclipse. It yielded 3,501 kilograms per hectare in across 27 locations. It is resistant to races 73 and 109 of Anthracnos. It looks similar to Zorro in appearance and black color retention following canning. And it was named in honor of Dr. Wayne Adams for his work in bean architect and establishing the black bean breeding program here at Michigan State University. The picture on my top right is a picture of Dr. Wayne Adams. And the picture on my left here in the field is actually a picture of Adams currently under seed production in Idaho. Our pinto bean charro is a good yielder and yielded 3,230 kilograms per hectare across 17 locations in mid-Michigan. It has erect architecture to avoid white mold. It has seed size equivalent to other pinto bean varieties. Excellent dry down and maturity without the need of any harvest aids. It also has improved cranning quality over other pinto varieties and a good level of dodging resistance. The Great Northern Niger yielded 3,166 kilograms per hectare across 15 locations in mid-Michigan and it has a good level of lauder resistance with architectural avoidance to white mold. Seed size equivalent to other great northern varieties and excellent dry down and maturity without the need of any harvest aids as well. It also has canning quality equivalent to other great northern varieties. Yellowstone is a yellow market class bean it is a good yielder for its market class and yielded 2,902 kilograms per hectare across four years, uniform dry down and maturity. It has upright bush habit with improved level of lauding resistance over current varieties and increased tolerance to white mold. It has superior yellow seed coat color and maturity compared to other bean varieties and canning quality equivalent to other yellow varieties. So one of the trials I wanted to show you is this trial I'm standing here in front of you today. This is our black bean advanced yield trial. So th while this trial is not unique to our breeding program, we have this routinely every year. This type of trial was started about uh, a couple of years back with my predecessor, Dr. Jim Kelly. Uh, the goal was to identify yield differential between varieties growing under no nitrogen and nitrogen uh, conditions. So this one I'm standing here right now is a trial where we ha actually applied nitrogen fertilizer. So dry bean actually takes uh, nitrogen uh, from, the, uh, from three sources. The first one is from the residual nitrogen in the soil. The second one is from added nitrogen. And the third is through symbiotic nitrogen fixation. Now dry bean, like other legumes, can actually fix nitrogen from, uh, through symbiotic nitrogen fixation. However, there are several factors that actually affect nit symbiotic nitrogen fixation. And one of these factors can be drought or adding too much nitrogen. So one way we actually determine symbiotic nitrogen f fixation in this field there are many ways to actually uh, measure uh, symbiotic nitrogen fixation, but one of, the one of the ways we use it in this trial is actually uh, putting these, this check in our field. And this check is a R99, is a mutant that actually does not nodulate. So basically it allows us to give us a measurement of residual nitrogen in the soil. So the yield differential between these two lines, subtracting the residual nitrogen in the soil, anything else will be due to symbiotic nitrogen fixation on these varieties. So one of the reasons that motivated us to pursue this study this year were the results we found in the past under these types of trials and conditions. We actually identified black bean lines that have equivalent and higher yield potential under low nitrogen conditions, as you can see in this graph. From a breeding perspective, this suggests that through recurrent selection, it would be possible to reduce the need for nitrogen fertilizer in Michigan dry bean production. And this is important for three reasons. First reason is we can develop varieties that perform well under low nitrogen soils, therefore reduce the need for added nitrogen fertilizer, thus reducing the ni nitrogen runoff, particularly important here in the Great Lakes area region. Second reason is that we can develop varieties that were well suited for both conventional and organic production. And the third reason is that we can reduce the incidence of white mold, increase when, added, when we add nitrogen fertilizer and increase biomass because we know that adding nitrogen fertilizer while increasing biomass does not necessarily increase yield. So as plant breeders, we're always thinking about how to increase uh, the efficiency of uh, throughput. So in the breeding program, we routinely collect data, uh, phenotypic data across the gr our growing season. This can be agronomic data as well as disease data. 
And some of our, we're always thinking about how we can apply new tools to our breeding program to make it more efficient. So one of these tools that we're actually exploring uh, in the breeding program this season is actually looking at uh, using unmanned aerial systems or drones. Uh, what we're going to be doing this season is basically comparing our field notes, our ergonomic as well as other uh, notes that we collect routinely, and compare it and ask yourself a question. Uh, it, can the UAV or uh, the drone co uh, collect more efficient data uh, than us? This would allow us to allow actually continue not only to collect more efficient data, but collect longitudinal data across our growing season and help us uh, collect more data on as well as larger populations. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, for uh, contributing that video. I know that you're with us this morning and uh, able to take questions. So as, uh, as questions come to mind, please uh, type them in the chat box. Dr. Gomez will do his best to, to answer them after I relay them to him. Um, next up is do, uh, Dr. Karen Sihi. Dr. Sihi is uh, gonna focus on dry bean end use quality with us this morning. Dr. Sihi, the floor is yours. Hello, I am Karen Sihi, a dry bean geneticist with USDA ARS at Michigan State University. A major focus of my lab's research is to improve end use quality traits in dry beans through plant breeding. Today, PhD student Weija Wong will speak about her research methods used to evaluate seed coat quality and canning quality in beans. Hello everyone, today I would like to talk about the research projects that we have been working on in improving the consumer quality of dry beans. First, I want to talk about mechanical damage and seco cracking. Dry beans are considered as fragile in terms of its susceptibility to mechanical damage. The injury can happen in the process from harvesting to post-harvesting handling, and the injury can be visible cracking on sea coat or non-visible internal damage. The morphological structure of most seeds determines greatly their susceptibility to mechanical damage. As you can see from this diagram, injury to any part of these indicated parts of a seed will result in a defective slow-growing seedling. For beans, the embryonic axis, where the root and shoot develop from, is positioned toward one side of the seed and protected only by a thin, fragile seed coat, which makes them very vulnerable to mechanical damage. During harvest, when the environment is very dry, the bean pods dry down too much and will result in low moisture level of the seeds. Research has found that seeds with moisture content below 12% are much more vulnerable to damage than seeds with a moisture content of 12% to 18%. When beans are handled at the local elevator, seed coat damages can be caused through dropping beans onto floors of store silos, or running through cleaning equipment, or conveyors at high speed. Mechanical damage can have significant impact on the germination rate and the emergence of bean seeds. It can cause bot head sittings, as shown in figure one. Seeds with mechanical damages will also result in unattractive canning products, which is a big consumer quality concern. In our lab, we do a seed coat staining test to measure the mechanical damage on our beans. I took a video to show you how this test was done. 100 seeds were randomly selected from each sample and they were soaked in Alden solution for 5 minutes. After 5 minutes, the seeds are dried and sorted into 5 different groups. The 5 groups are one. Group one, no visible seed coat damage. Um, group two, one or two minor cracks. Group three, several minor cracks or one major crack. Group four, more than one major crack. And group five, split seed. And the seed numbers are counted for each category group. As we know, at local elevators, less than 10% of checked seeds is considered acceptable for a load of dry seeds, or 20% for soaked seeds. 
These tables show the CCO cracking rate of the genotypes we have tested. There are commercial varieties and our breeding lines. Bell thrush means they were hand harvested and threshed with a bell thresher, which is very gentle and costs very little mechanical damage. Combine thrush means the beans were threshed through combine. As you can see, the tested kidney beans showed a very good range of susceptibility to mechanical damage, but the black beans didn't show that much variability. We want to further explore the genetic variability for mechanical resistance in our beans, especially kidney beans. And here is a video by Dr. Karen Sihi. In order to develop bean varieties with reduced susceptibility to mechanical damage, it is important to understand genetic variability for this trait and to identify potential parental sources that can be used in breeding. So with that goal in mind, 66 diverse kidney beans were planted at the Montcalm Research Farm this season. They included 21 dark red kidney, 36 light red kidney, and nine white kidney. Our evaluation plan at harvest is to pull entire plants and thresh the plants when the seeds reach a low moisture of about 12%. And two different threshing methods will be used. One is a gentle belt thresher to prevent damage, and the other is a heggy plot combine set to a high cylinder speed that will induce damage. These seeds will then be evaluated for seed coat check using the iodine staining method. Here is a clip of what the beans look like in the field as of August 15th. Canning quality is another important trait we are working with. I would like to show you the method we use to test for canning quality of our beans. First, the seeds are manually cleaned and the moisture content is measured. Then a certain amount of subsample is weighed and placed in a mesh bag. The seeds are then soaked and blanched or only blanched without soaking depending on the seed type. The blanched seeds are transferred to cans with hot brine added to them. Cans are sealed with an automatic sealing system and then cooked in a retort. For post-scanning evaluation, we usually do a sensory evaluation followed by other quality traits measurement. First, cans are matched with labeled paper tray. Then a group of trained panelists evaluate each sample for the appearance with a score of one to five. One be the worst and five be the best. With black beans, we also do score for its color. After that, samples are rinsed and weighed. A high quality image is taken with our machine vision system, which is a black box with a stable illumination source and a digital camera that is connected to a computer. We also measure texture as the maximum force to cut through 100 gram of subsample, and we measure color with a colorimeter. Here I have a video to show you how the texture analyzer and the colorimeter work. We have recently started to work with pouch processing. The goal is to process beans using shorter time duration for improved physical and sensory quality while ensuring food safety. This is what the retortable flexible pouch in our study looks like. For research purpose, thermocouple is attached to the pouch so that we can measure the internal temperature during the retort process. The advantages of pouches include they provide the shelf stability of metal cans, they provide consumer convenient ready-to-eat products, also they have lower carbon footprint due to lower energy requirement during food processing and transportation. Here is our method of small-scale pouch processing. First, beans are prepared following the small-scale canning protocol and placed in pouches. Then pouches are sealed with a vacuum sealer. We need to repeat step one and two for each sample. Then pouches are placed in special designed metal trays and loaded to the retort. 
thermocouples on the pouches are attached to external sensors so that we can monitor the internal temperature and decide when to call a stop for the retort process and ensure the fuel safety. Finally, the quality evaluation is also conducted just like what we do for the cans. These photos show you how we used to the post canning sensory evaluation. Beans are laid on the bench and our group members come and score them for appearance. But this is how we do the sensory evaluation now. Okay, so I'm going to show you the first sample for today. With our machine vision system, I share the computer screen with our group members through a Zoom okay. meeting. Everyone sees the you samples one by sample. one and score them like yes. we usually do. Okay. So you may start to score this one. This is sample number one. Last but not the least, we have made an infographic to tell the farm to fork story of beans. This is designed by me and illustrated by Pia Garcia, a graphic designer we work with. It consists of an infographic and a set of stickers for of the characters. The target audience of this infographic are kids aged 0 to 12. The idea is to educate them about the process that our beans go through from farm to our table. We believe that kids can influence their parents in what to purchase for food. Hopefully, they will find this infographic very interesting and want to eat more beans. Thank you for your attention. This research is funded by a USDA OREI grant. And we'd also like to give a special thanks to Everbest Organic and Saddleberg Farm for their support with this project, as well as the CS Mott Sustainable Agriculture Fellowship received by Weija Wang. Thank you. Weija, thank you, Dr. Sihi. Uh, again, good presentation, informative. Uh, our customers, our consumers are always looking for better quality, so we're anxious to improve. Please let us know if we can help you in any way, by the way. Um, continue to monitor the chat box, and I think we had a couple questions in there. I believe uh, Scott Bales is going to address one of those uh, during his presentation. So. Um, with that, Scott, uh, MSU's new driving system specialist is going to talk about our performance trials. Go ahead, Scott. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Scott Bales. I'm a research and extension specialist for Michigan State University. Today, we are at a driving bean performance trial in Tuscola County, hosted by Benarski Farms near Colwood, Michigan. Today, I'd like to take this opportunity to share a little bit with you about what I do as a research program on farm within the state of Michigan. Within my program, I really see the focus as improving the profitability as well as sustainability of dry bean production within the state. Uh, to do this, we need to take a system approach. And within that system, I think of three different options that we have or tools that are at our disposal. The first would be genetic, the varieties that we're planting, the second would be our agronomic practices, things that we're able to change within our farm. And the last one would be the chemical efficacy of our products that we're using within those agronomic practices. In evaluating these three categories, we utilize locations such as this one here to generate data that is representative of real commercial production conditions in the climatic environment that we are growing dry beans. In 2020, we have four locations in the Thumb and Saginaw Valley that are used in this testing. These locations focus on the production of small and medium seeded beans and direct harvest systems. However, we do have additional locations in the western portion of the state that focus on our large seeded beans, such as kidney and cranberry. These production practices are very different than what we find here in the Saginaw Valley, and thus we utilize a separate location. Looking at the first category of genetics, uh, within our program, we are testing 148 different varieties in 10 separate market classes in this year of 2020 alone. Of these 148, approximately half of these are commercially available varieties that you'd be able to purchase for production on your farm, and the other half are experimental, not yet released to growers, still within the possession of breeders. All of these varieties are evaluated for yield, disease resistance or tolerance, some specific agronomics such as maturity, lodging, as well as flowering date, and lastly, we also look at end use quality, how well that bean holds up in a can or on a dry pack of beans. It is important that we closely study all these elements so that varieties not only perform well in the field for the grower, but also result in a quality product 
from our Michigan growers. An example of this testing can be found right here behind me as we look at this Tuscola County Standard Black Bean Trial. This trial has four replications with 30 entries. Nine of these entries are commercially available and the remainder are new material coming in from both public and private breeders. The second category we work in is our agronomic practices. This includes the studying of our basic fundamentals of production, such as crop rotations, planting populations, and fertilizer use. A major question that has risen in recent years around fertilizer use, with nitrogen rates at the lead of this discussion. For this reason, we have established nitrogen trials in nine locations this year, as well as micronutrient trials in four locations. This is building upon a data set that we began last year on a similar scale to help provide valuable insights to how intensely we should be managing our dry bean crop. An interesting dynamic to this work is a potential correlation between increased nitrogen use rates and the severity of our white mold infection when present. While it is too early in the growing season here in Colwood to know if we have achieved white mold infection in this end trial, it will be interesting to watch as harvest approaches. Here we have applied four rates of nitrogen, increasing from our base rate of 40 pounds per acre, which was spread by Benarski Farms. When I planted on June 6th, I added an additional few pounds of nitrogen via 2x2 applications. When I planted on June 6th, we added additional nitrogen rates via 2x2 application. After this additional nitrogen rate, we increased from our 40 base pounds to 50 pounds per acre for treatment two, 70 pounds per acre for treatment three, and 100 pounds per acre for treatment four. You will notice that we also have a population component to this trial, with our standard population being 130,000 plants per acre. From there, we had additional treatments with those same nitrogen rates across populations of both 100,000 plants per acre, as well as 154,000 plants per acre. These trials are also replicated around the state because when we're looking at white mold, it's often difficult to achieve white mold infection in the trial when we are actually looking for it. And this is why it's important to have a wide footprint across the state in these four locations to help understand this possible correlation between nitrogen rates, populations, and white mold severity. The third category that I work in is testing the efficacy of many different inputs. Here at this location, we have five separate trials devoted solely to the purpose of testing this. These include a seed start seed treatment trial, an endomyx biological trial, propults in furrow, and also a propults for plant health trial. These trials are important as an unbiased source of information for growers when making input management decisions. We often receive questions such as, should I apply an R1 fungicide if I don't think I'll get white mold? To test this, we have this trial in front of us. This trial looks at six different treatments, uh, including multiple rates of propulses, propulse at different timings, as well as Delario. In this location, we wanted to look in the, the potential beneficial plant health response from these applications. This specific trial may yield better white mold data due to the extra growth this season. And this brings us back to the importance of having multiple replications across multiple locations within Michigan so that at the end of the day we can produce a representative set of results come harvest time. So a second application of fungicides was applied seven days ago today. Uh, as a result of that we can see a bit of a plant response from the six, eight, and ten ounces of propults resulting in that darker green uh, color of those beans. And these beans are a viper small red, so they are typically pretty dark green, uh, but we can see a plant response at this time from those applications. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's virtual field day. Um, I hope to see you all again online and in person someday soon. Great job, Scott. Thank you very much. Those plots Thanks, look Joe. excellent. I think you, uh, I think you recorded that on August 10th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yep. So we're a little ways back there. Um, so those beans were still pretty green at that point. Um, some white mold has been visible in that plot since that day. Um, so we're hoping to be able to go back and kind of reshoot some of these things and maybe take a closer look at some of those varieties, uh, especially those four newer ones that Francisco mentioned. And we'll hopefully have all that available for you guys this fall. Um, there were a few things I wanted to share with you guys before I did let you go. Um, and most of these are available resources as we're looking towards harvest here. As we move forward in the growing season, you know, our kind of next step here for a lot of growers is the application of a pre-harvest um, harvest aid if needed. Um, I always recommend taking a look at the MSU weed control guide um, that can be found online as well as in a hard copy. Um, there's some great recommendations in there from Dr. Christy Sprague, who you'll hear from later. You know, as we look a little farther, maybe post-harvest, I know seed decisions are made very early in the you know, in the winter and late fall, um, variety 
trial results can be found on the Michigan Bean Commission website, forward slash research, research um, as well as on varietytrials.msu.edu. Um, and that site has trials from both myself as well as MSU breeding program if you're interested in taking a second look at some of those. Um, and the third resource I wanna bring up, um, if you just Google, you know, maybe Scott Bales Dry Beans MSU, um, it'll bring you to this page. It's a College of Ag and Natural Resources. Um, and under that page, you'll find myself, but under that section, there's links to some of the work that I've done and some other of our colleagues. You know, the longer I've been in this position, the longer that list grows, um, and it's a good place to you know, find some basic dry bean information if you're looking for that. And with that, I'd just like to thank everybody for being here. I know it's a little bit different than we're used to, um, but I'd like to take this time to take any questions you guys may have. Scott, I know there was one in the chat box uh, earlier directed toward Dr. Gomez about nitrogen. Uh, any, any additional comments to that? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to comment on that a little bit. So there, in that video, you could see that we are working on, you know, looking at nitrogen application rates. Um, this will be the second year that we've done that, uh, both in small plots as well as strip trials. Uh, within all those trials, we do pull soil samples to look at that residual N at the beginning of the season, as well as organic matter that you mentioned in your question. Um, and we always want to include that as a factor when we're analyzing those results of where we have a response and where we did not. You know, this might be something that Kurt Sankey will comment on a little bit later, as he is our nutrient management specialist as well. Okay, and I know that uh, we've got field tours coming up September 1st through September 10th, and that schedule is also posted on uh, Michigan Bean Commission website. So uh, hopefully you will get a chance to have a face-to-face -face visit at those, uh, at those locations. Uh, we'll move on then. Uh, Dr. Kurt Steinke is with us today. Uh, talk about nutrition management for dry beans and transition into sugar beets. Dr. Steinke. Hello everyone. My name is Kurt Steinke. We're standing here today in some of our 2020 dry bean applied research plots, looking at a number of nutrients and a number of uh, field research plots that we have going on this year. Uh, this is the second year looking at about six different nutrients. What we're looking at and standing in here today, we're looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, zinc, and manganese studies. Now, there's a couple of reasons why we're focusing on these specific nutrients. One of those is management practices, practices have changed over the last decade or two. Now, when you look at dry bean production today versus many years ago, we're looking at narrower rows. We're looking at different varieties. We're probably also looking at a little bit more biomass production and canopy closure. And we wanna see what differences we see in grain yield by revisiting or re-examining the application of some of these nutrients. There are two key areas with some of these nutrients that we really wanna focus on. One is, are we fertilizing our beans and increasing our disease occurrence? For example, something like white mold, we don't wanna have that closed canopy sooner in the season. The second thing is, are we fertilizing our beans and cutting down on the nodulation and therefore decreasing the efficiency of that plant or the nitrogen fixation capabilities of that plant? So those are a couple of the areas that we're really focusing on with that dry bean production. We're going to go over a couple different uh, uh, plots and scenarios here this morning. I do also have a graduate student uh, looking at two of these projects, specifically the nitrogen and sulfur projects. Thank you, Kurt. My name is Christian Twilliger. I am a second year graduate research assistant in the soil fertility and nutrient management program. And as he said, I'm actually looking at this end study here. And so what this is composed of is four different varieties, two being black bean varieties, Zenith and Black Bear, a navy bean variety, Merlin, and a small red bean variety, Viper. And with that, we have increments of 30 pounds of N starting at zero. So from zero N to 150 pounds of N. And last year in 2019, what we saw was that there was no grain yield response, even though we did have a biomass response from that zero to 150 pounds of N. And so why this is important is that in dry years is what we saw from last year is that maybe that N is there in the soil. However, when it's dry and the soil 
just doesn't have the moisture so that plants can actually uptake that nitrogen, we won't see that grain yield response. And so with that, you might, if it is a wet year, possibly, you might actually get that white mold that Kurt was talking about um, from that biomass and cut back on nodulation. So that's part of why we are looking at the study today and why we're trying to figure out what's the most optimum nitrogen rate. Here we're looking at Zenith with zero pounds of N. And if you notice, you can see less biomass. The canopy is not closed, and you can see that there is early senescence of the plants. Now here we have the same variety, but with 30 pounds of N. And if you look, there's more biomass, the plants are greener, there's less senescence, and the canopy is more closed. So what we're looking at is 60 pounds of N, and if you really notice, the canopy is closed almost. And we have those green plants like we've been seeing as we increase the N rate, but really this is a nice looking plot. At 90 pounds of N, we are still seeing that increase in biomass. However, with that comes a risk of disease like white mold, and it does not always mean that there might be a green yield response. At 120 pounds of N, if I'm a farmer, this is what I want to see, but we want to make sure that this N is actually paying off. And again, as we mentioned before, there is that additional risk of disease and, of course, a cutback in nodulation. Here we applied 150 pounds of N. So it's hard to notice, but if you actually compared it to the other plot, you would see a slight decrease in biomass. So at this rate, this is what we saw in 2019, was that at 120 pounds, we saw a greater increase in biomass than what we did at 150 pounds of N. And again, there's still a slight risk of disease like white mold and less nodulation. So what you're looking at now is similar to what we just saw in the field. However, we went out and pulled a single plant per plot just to show the point on how nitrogen can change the morphology and the structure of an ind individual dry bean plant. So what you're looking at from left to right is 0 to 150 units of N in 30 unit increments. One of the first things that sticks out is the overall biomass production. When you change from 0 to 30, you see the change in both petiole length, stem length, and leaf size. From 30 to 60, we see a slight increase. From 60 to 90, we also see a slight increase in biomass. And then we really see that additional biomass put on that plant at that 120 and 150 unit of N rate. However, what we didn't see out in the field is as you look at the 90, 120, and 150 pound rates of N, you'll start to see that there's leaves in the bottom of the canopy that are senescing. And so that is because the canopy is so dense from the additional nitrogen that we applied that those leaves can no longer receive sunlight. So one of the take home message we really want growers and producers to understand is you have to balance that grain yield response with that biomass response and understand the difference between the two. And remember, at the end of the day, you have to balance grain production with that overall profitability. So if you want to learn more about dry beans and the six nutrients that we talked about today, please visit soil.msu.edu. Hi there, Kurt Steinke here. We're standing in a field of sugar beets here this afternoon. You know, we're sitting about eight to nine weeks from harvest, and the question at the start of the season that we always try to get an answer mid and late season is, did I hit the right end rate? So, sugar beet management has changed extensively over the last one to two decades. You start looking at climate variability, both in the spring and late summer. You look at some of those wet and dry springs that we've had in combination with some of those very wet and dry August that, that we've had, and that can really impact overall tonnage and sugar production. So climate variability is one of the biggest issues that we now deal with. Another issue that we deal with is soils are staying warmer for a longer period of time. When you look at soil temperatures in October and November, it, quite often soil temperatures do not drop below 50 degrees Fahrenheit until sometime in the first, first or second week in November. And the third big change that we've dealt with over the last two decades is the double in tonnage. All right, tonnage has increased about twofold from where it was about 20 years ago. How does this impact? The, the correct end rate and how does this impact how you choose that end rate going forward is something that we'll discuss here today. 
So here you can, you can see an example of seven rates of N going in incremental order from left to right. We have zero pounds of N to the acre, all the way over to 240 pounds of N to the acre. So with the first beet you see on the left, this is our check plot. This is what we get when we do not fertilize sugar beets. The second beet from the left is 40 units of N in a two by two applied at planting. One of the biggest differences that we notice is, look at that tap root. We start to see that tap root formation with that two by two applied fertilizer. The third beet from the left, that is our 40 units of N in a two by two and 40 units Coulter inject side dress at two to four leaf. We don't see much change in tonnage at this point in time, but we do see a little bit of change in overall biomass production. That beet in the very center, the fourth one from the left is 120 units of N, 40 in a two by two, in 80 units Coulter inject side dress at that two to four leaf stage. Again, we don't see a huge change in that below ground plant development and a slight change in above ground plant development at that end rate. The fifth beat from the left is that 160 units of N, 40 units of N in a two by two, 120 units of N applied side dress, Coulter inject two to four leaf. And what do we notice there? That is usually about that end rate where we start to see that beet during this time of year really start to bulk out below ground and we see that biomass production above ground. When we go beyond that rate, the last two beats on the far right, we have a hundred or excuse me, we have 200 units of N and 240 units of N. Both have 40 units of N applied two by two at plant and then either uh, 160 units of N applied side dress at two to four leaf or, two, or uh, 200 units of N applied side dress two to four leaf. There again, we see a little bit of an increase in below ground tonnage, and we tend to see a lot more biomass production this time of the year. We'll have to stay tuned to see where that optimal end rate was for the year 2020. Joe, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steinke. We did have one question in the uh, chat box about PSNT and wondering if that'd be a good tool to predict end rates in dry beans. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, Joe, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the question with PSNT, when you start looking at PSNT testing, for those of you that don't know what PSE, PSNT stands for, it's the pre dress nitrate test. So really what that is intended for is to look at how much of your organic N application typically, so we're talking about manures, biosolage, how much of that has mineralized into nitrate at the time of planting. So whether you can use that to predict your, your dry bean or sugar beet test remains to be seen. Typically, again, it's more about those organic applications. You know, when we start looking at starter fertilizers, um, you know, we've seen this a lot more when, when, when we start looking at corn and some of our small grains, such as wheat. You know, there's, there's gauges we can use. Uh, for instance, if that uh, uh, nitrate test comes back uh, less than five parts per million, oftentimes we'll see a response to end fertilizer. So that's one factor to keep in mind. Um, another factor to keep in mind would be there's been a lot of discussion, especially around dry beans this morning, talking about nitrogen fixation potential of dry beans. And yes, dry beans can fix their own nitrogen. Typically, you know, as a rule of thumb, we're looking at about 40 pounds of N. Uh, and that's in optimal conditions. So another thing to keep in mind is, you know, when you look at the variable weather patterns that we've had, you know, pick a month, whether it's May, June, July, August, we've seen probably anywhere from less than one inch to eight inches of rain in any of those months over the last five, seven, eight years. So any factor that impacts plant growth and development will also impact nitrogen fixation. And so relying exclusively on end fixation becomes very, diff very difficult when you look at the variable weather conditions that we have seen. So that would be another factor to keep in mind uh, with regards to, to relying exclusively on that. And you know, the, the, the other thing I wanna throw in as we kind of gear or change the conversation more towards sugar beets is we'll have a better idea here coming up uh, in the next month or so how that, that uh, tonnage outlook looks. You know, one thing we've noticed over the last couple of years is our optimal end rates for sugar production 
have averaged about 25 pounds of N to the acre less than our yield. All right, so that's something to keep in mind. Whatever your yield response is for beets, that tonnage response, our optimal sugar production has averaged about 25 units or 25 pounds of N per acre less than that. And that's just over the last one to two years. So with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, I'll be here all morning if there are any more questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Steinke. Appreciate your comments. Uh, obviously continue to put your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to get those answered. Uh, but we're gonna transition into uh, wheat control for, for sugar beets uh, with Dr. Christy Sprague. Dr. Sprague, the floor is yours. Well, good morning. Today is August 11th and my name is Christy Sprague. I'm a weed scientist here at Michigan State University. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about some of the weed control challenges that we have in sugar beets. And primarily right now, the biggest challenges that we have are with glyphosate or herbicide resistant weeds. And the two biggest ones are glyphosate resistant horseweed or mare's tail, and then also glyphosate resistant water hemp. And today we're gonna to look at some of our research trials where we're looking at different options to control both of these uh, weeds. The first trial that we're at here is at the Michigan State University Agronomy Farm in East Lansing, Michigan, where we're looking at trying to integrate um, using a cereal rye cover crop with um, some different herbicide treatments. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce uh, Brian Stiles. Brian is one of our research technicians here at Michigan State University, and he is working towards a master's degree, and this is one of the trials that he's looking at. So good morning, Brian. Morning, Christy, thank you. So I'm standing here in my sugar beet plot. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of horseweed behind me. Um, horseweed's a, a big issue in Michigan. Um, a lot of this out here is spring emerging. Um, and what we're doing is we're looking at uh, cereal rye cover crops out here trying to suppress the horseweed with um, different herbicide applications of Stinger. Um, as I said, this is my no cover plot. Um, behind me you can see we had um, just two applications of uh, Roundup. Um, ahead of me here we've got two different strips um, where we had two applications of Stinger at two ounces and then we have also another application at six to eight leaf of four ounces and those are the same all the way across the plot. Even with our two, uh, two applications of Stinger, you can see that we still have some horseweed uh, pressure in our plot compared to the other um, applications. I'm standing in the early burn down strip now. Um, this rye was terminated 14 days before planting. Um, you can see we still have uh, mare's uh, pressure. Um, there's not much rye residue on the ground. Um, this rye was approximately eight inches tall at Feeks 4 stage when it was terminated. Um, and you can see again here, um, we had two applications of Stinger and then one application followed. And then we also had two applications of glyphosate. So here I'm standing in the at plant burn down. Um, <clears throat> in combination with this, we also had a few strips with the roller and roller crimper. Um, you can see there's still some rye residue on the ground. Um, last year we've seen some pretty uh, good results with this. Um, the rye has provided some uh, horseweed suppression with the uh, stinger applications. The last strip that I'll be showing today, uh, this is the delayed burn down. Um, this rye was terminated uh, one week after planting. It was uh, feek stage 10, um, approximately 45 inches tall. And you can see here that, uh, that the beets, they look similar in size now, but early season, um, the, the competition from the rye uh, suppressed the beet growth a little bit. And we did see some negative impacts from that last year uh, when it came time for sugar beet yield. Well, thanks Brian for walking through those strips. Um, again, we're trying to figure out how we can integrate some of these different things and maybe get some better horseweed suppression. And as Brian mentioned, we had those uh, where we only had one application of Stinger and hoping that the horseweed would suppress that mare's tail early. So um, this will be the second year research that we have on this and we'll, we're really looking forward to seeing what the yields are and what the overall results are. And we'll re be reporting on that at the uh, uh, winter meetings, whether they're virtually or in person, and then also we'll have a lot of those results on our website, msuweeds.com. 
So we're here up here in Shepherd, Michigan, looking at some sugar beet plots where we're trying to look at management strategies for water hemp. Um, water hemp is one of those weeds that all of a sudden we're seeing pop up around Michigan and it's become a huge problem in a lot of our our agronomic crops. Particularly, we see it a lot in soybeans because it can go up above the canopy and we're seeing more and more problems showing up in sugar beets. Over the last few years, we've been trying to do some different management strategies to look at what are some of the best treatments to control water hemp and sugar beets. When we look at um, the options that we have, a lot of what we're doing is trying to overlap residual herbicides or some of those pre-emergence herbicides. So things like uh, metolachlor, like dual 2 magnum, or outlook, or potentially warrant, and trying to apply those at a time when sugar beets, or when the water hemp isn't up, so we're getting good pre-emergence control of those, um, of the water hemp. So what we have here today is basically a study where we've designed, designed it using some of the common herbicides that we can use now. So right here we have a sugar beet plot. Um, it's really hard to actually see the sugar beets in here, but this had two applications of glyphosate. So you can see we have a very high population of water hemp and that it is very tolerant or resistant to glyphosate. What we talked about is using residual herbicides overlapping. So without a pre-emergence herbicide, we're kind of starting, hopefully trying to get that application on before the first water hemp comes up. What we have here are two applications of dual with no pre. So we're looking at the first application being at the two leaf beets and then about six to eight leaf. You can see we have much better than control than the untreated, but we still have water hemp out here. So that timing of those residuals are gonna be very important. So in addition to dual, we've also looked at two applications of Outlook. Um, you know, we do see water hemp coming through. I wouldn't say it's any better or worse than dual. And we're also doing the same thing when we look at the next treatments, which are gonna be two applications of Warrant. Again, none of these have a pre-emergence herbicide. So we're trying to get these residuals on before the first water hemp comes up. And typically in Michigan, we're seeing water hemp come up about that third week of May. So if we're planting sugar beets early, probably just doing those overlapping residuals is gonna do us pretty good. So we'll take a quick look at those the Warren applications, and then we'll look at what happens when we put some pre-emergence herbicides down and follow, follow it up with those treatments. So in addition to, again, looking at dual outlook, here's our warrant plot. Again, no pre-emergence herbicide. I mean, we're seeing pretty darn good control compared to what the untreated is, but we still have some that escape. So again, I think the timing is extremely important on these residuals. And with our earlier planted beets, we're probably okay. But as we get later, we want to make sure we get those residuals on early. And one of the reasons that this is a, um, can be a problem is we have very few products that are actually labeled pre-emergence. And like I said, we looked at lower rates of dual and hopefully we can get potentially um, a, a section 18 or 24C, excuse me, to uh, ha allow those applications in the future. The other thing that we did, instead of um, looking just at the post applications of these residuals, again, we put some pre-emergence herbicides down and then followed up with the uh, post residuals. So what you see here, there are four different treatments that go back. All of these had ethafumisate at two pints applied pre, and then we came back either with two applications of dual, two applications of warrant, two applications of outlook, or we also looked at two applications of the, at the fumisate post, and all four of those uh, treatments worked great. So we've got almost 100% control here. Um, again, this is one of our replications, and you can see that uh, it looks great compared to what we have for an untreated control. So in addition to looking at the fumisate pre followed by those overlapping residuals, we also looked at that half pint of dual pre-emergence and did the overlapping residuals. And we also had extremely good water hemp control. Again, with these treatments, timing is gonna be very important. We wanna make sure that these applications are on before any of the water hemp has come up. So one of the other things that people always ask is, well, could Stinger actually control water hemp? Well, the plot I have right behind me is two applications of Stinger, two ounces followed by four ounces, which is kind of our general recommendation for horseweed control or glyphosate resistant horseweed control. And you can see we really don't get any water hemp control. Um, so 
what we've done is we've tried to include those stinger applications with um, overlapping residuals, whether it's with dual or warrant. And the plot that I'm walking up to right now, this was actually stinger plus warrant at the two leaf stage and then stinger plus warrant again at the six to eight leaf stage. And you can see things look pretty good. So if you had both water hemp and horseweed, this is one way that we could potentially take care of it. We have duplicated this study at the Saginaw Valley Research and Extension Center and basically to look at what effects some of these treatments have on sugar beet yields in more of a sugar beet growing region. Um, again, our results will be available at msuweeds.com and we'll be talking about them throughout the winter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sprague. <clears throat> Appreciate your comments. Um, we did have one question in the chat box for you. Uh, as we move to using more chemistry in sugar beets again, do we have any issues rotating to dry beans from sugar beets, and specifically Stinger? Wondered if you could comment on that. Sure, thanks, Joe, um, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, that's one of the concerns that we do have, particularly is the the Stinger and rotating to either dry beans or soybeans, um, because we are using a little bit more Stinger than what we had been using when we were using microrate. So it's really important to think about that when you're setting up your rotations and what herbicides you're using. Um, uh, the sandier soils are ones, um, and especially if we have a dry year where we can see that. Tillage does help uh, dilute some of that, those stinger applications, so it makes it a little bit safer, but again, keep those in mind. And on those sandier soils, especially when we have low rainfall, we wanna probably stick away from, or stay away from a sugar beet or a dry bean, or, dry beans planted after sugar beets. All right, thank you. Again, uh, all the presenters are still with us as far as I can tell, and uh, so if there are questions, please uh, type them in the chat box. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Daniel Bublitz, uh, sugar beet extension specialist, is with us this morning to talk about uh, Circospora. Daniel. Good morning. My name is Daniel Bublitz. I'm the Director of Sugar Beet Advancement, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for the virtual field day today. I'm going to start by talking about the Sugar Beet Advancement Variety Trials. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with these trials, they are large plot strip trials, which we conduct with growers throughout the area. In these trials, we compare 12 different sugar beet varieties, which the Sugar Beet Advancement Committee has selected. These beets are grown and maintained by the sugar beet farmer, just like he'd maintain all the rest of his beets. Then at the end of the season, we collect yield data from them to see how each variety performed under that management system. Throughout the growing season, we scout the trials several times, checking them for quality, as well as for different agronomic traits the beets possess. These include emergence, tolerance to foliar and root diseases, and the impact of sugar beet cyst nematode. This year, we have a total of seven variety trials, six of which are located here in Michigan, and one more that's located in Ontario, Canada. Today, we are at the trial which is managed by Wadsworth Farms, east of Sandusky. This trial was planted on April 6th, and shortly after planting, it experienced several nights of freezing temperatures. Unfortunately, this, along with some crusting issues that we had in the field, led to a lower emergence than what we had hoped for. In fact, we had some stand counts which were as low as 60 beets in 100 feet of row, which that's right on the line as to whether or not we should replant the trial, and we agonized over that decision for about a week. Eventually, the grower came up with a solution that provides a unique educational opportunity for the rest of the farmers in the co-op. So he decided to replant the trial, and we did so on May 7th, but instead of uh, tearing out the old trial, he actually planted the new trial adjacent to that one. So now we basically have two variety trials at this location, one with an earlier planting date, but with a lower stand, and another with a later planting date, but a near perfect stand. So I'm actually standing in the early planted trial right now, and you can see that the stand is a little bit lighter here. You can see a couple of patches in the beets. With these two parts of the trial, we hope to determine if replanting this field was the correct decision in this particular situation. 
Since planting, there are two major factors which have influenced these trials. The first of these is sugar beet cyst nematode. Unfortunately, there's a high level of sugar beet cyst nematode in this field, and in fact, you can actually see a visual difference in the beets between the susceptible and resistant varieties. So behind me, you can see two such varieties, with the variety on the right being resistant to sugar beet cyst nematode, and the one on the left being susceptible to it. You can see that the resistant variety has a little bit darker green color, and a little, little bit more full canopy, whereas the susceptible variety has a little bit lighter canopy and is more of a lime green color. Here, we have an example of a sugar beet that is susceptible to a sugar beet cyst nematode. You can see that there are several little white dots which have formed on the root hairs of this beet. Those are actually the cysts created by the nematode. So if you can find cysts like this on sugar beets from your farm, you should definitely consider planting a nematode resistant variety the next time that you plant beets there. The second major factor influencing this trial is the presence of root disease. So I've actually found a couple of different root diseases in this field, but the primary one appears to be Rhizectonia crown and root rot. And the amount of disease that we found in this field has varied based on the varietal tolerance. So some varieties which are susceptible have more disease, and those that are tolerant have less disease. So behind me, we have a variety that's susceptible to Rhizectonia crown and root rot. You can see that there is a large patch of beets that have been infected by the disease and that are being killed because of it. These are two examples of sugar beets showing symptoms of Rhizoctonia root rot. You can see that this is a very dry rot and it's very dark in color, nearly black even. As you can see in the cross section, this is a very shallow rot which starts from the outside of the beet and works its way into the, to the inside. There's a very clearly defined line between the infected and healthy tissue. Now I'm going to shift gears and show you an aerial image that was taken of this trial. The first thing you probably notice is the difference in stand count between the early and the late parts of the trial. In the early section, you can notice there is quite a reduced stand as opposed to the late part of the trial. The next thing I'm sure that you notice is that there are definitely large patches of beets that have been uh, affected by root rot in both the early and the late planting sessions. Finally, you can notice some sharp differences in leaf color and canopy size between the different varieties in both parts of the trial. It'll be interesting to see how all these factors come together to influence the yield of each variety. Once the results are collected from this trial, as well as the other sugar beet advancement trials and the Michigan sugar variety trials, they will be compiled into the 2020 REACH Variety Trial Book, which will be sent out later this fall. The next project I'm going to discuss is a new one for sugar beet advancement, which is a Cercospora leaf spot fungicide resistance screening project. As you are all painfully aware, fungicide resistance is a major problem for managing Cercospora leaf spot. Two fungicides in particular which have a problem with resistance are the strobilarins, which include products such as Headline, Gem, and Flint Extra, as well as the benzimidazoles, which include Topsin. If, if your Cercospora has resistance to these fungicides, they will be much less effective, but unfortunately, most growers have no way of knowing what level of fungicide resistance they have in their field. Therefore, the goal of this project is to provide you with in-season information as to the level of resistance in your field. This information can be taken, and with the help of your Michigan Sugar Field Consultant, you can optimize your fungicide program with it. In addition, this will provide valuable information to researchers about how Cercospora fungicide resistance is changing throughout the area and throughout the season. Now, I'm gonna take a moment to discuss how this project will work. First, you'll need to identify Cercospora leaf spot in your field. I know Jamie Wilbur is probably going to talk more about this in her presentation, but what you're looking for with Cercospora lesion is a small circular lesion that's about an eighth to a quarter of an inch wide. These lesions will be a tan or ash gray color in the center, and they'll have reddish purple or brown borders. The two most important features that you're looking for with Cercospora 
are these black dots in the center of the lesions, which are called pseudostomata, as well as the formation of silver needle-like canidia, like it's in the bottom picture. If you identify a cuspid leaf spot in your field, the next step is then to collect leaves that have cercospor on them. The way you're going to do this is by taking your sugar beet leaf and breaking it off where the petiole and the leaf blade come together, just like that. Once you have your, your leaf samples, you want to eventually collect 10 of those randomly from throughout the field. Now I know it's going to be easier to collect those samples all from one spot, but that won't really give you the best results and won't really give you the best picture as to fungicide resistance in your field. So once you have your 10 samples, you want to take a one gallon Ziploc bag that's been pre-labeled with the date and the field location. You want to take your samples, place them inside the bag, then seal that bag. If you're uncomfortable with collecting these samples by yourself, you can call your local field consultant to assist you with that. Once the samples are collected, your field consultant will take them to a central drop-off point, and from there, they will be delivered to Saginaw Valley State University, where Dr. Dennis Gray and his team will conduct a PCR test on them. This test will allow us to see if these samples are resistant to either the benzimidazoles or the strobilarins. Here to talk more about what's going to happen in the lab for this project is Dr. Dennis Gray. Hello, my name is Dr. Dennis Gray. I'm part of the, uh, the SPSU component of the Cercospora re uh, Resistance Screening Project. Uh, my collaborator and student, Kelsey Lewis, is doing the filming on this right, this right now. What we're going to do is tell you just a little bit about how we, what we do with the samples you give to us and a bit about how we extract information from that. So coming from the field, we will be receiving from you sugar beet leaves. Now this one looks rather pathetic because it has been in the refrigerator for almost a month at this point, but this leaf still is giving us good, is giving us good information. So we start off by receiving samples from the field. At that point, we will then identify the, the spots that are indicative of cercospor infection. And from those spots, we will then extract some, extract some DNA. That DNA we will then send through this, this procedure called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which serves to amplify DNA into, well, amplify sections of the DNA molecule, molecule up into large numbers of copies. Now, some of these copies of the DNA molecule will possess mutations that can be, be uh, cut by a particular enzyme called the restriction enzyme. Other copies will not possess that mutation, and so they will not be cut. After we've done the PCR, we do this restriction digest, which will either cut or not cut particular fragments. Those fragments, which are not cut, indicate that the, the Cercospora uh, fungus that was present in, in the spots is not resistant to the, fun, to the target fungicide that we're examining. Those uh, sections, that those fragments that do get cut, that indicates that the, the Cercospora um, uh, genotypes will be resistant to the particular fungicide that we are, we are examining. That's what it's here. If you have a full length uh, piece of DNA, it's uncut, if it's cut, it'll be broken up into small fragments. And we can determine whether something is cut or uncut by running these fragments out on something called a gel. And it looks like a little piece of jello. You put the DNA solution into a set of little, little depressions, little wells, apply a voltage across the gel that will cause the DNA to move. And then, depending upon the number of bands that we see in the gel after it has been stained, that will tell us what, whether or not something has been cut or uncut. If, it's, if it does not cut, we'll just see a single band. If there are multiple bands, that indicates that it has been cut at that particular, that particular site. None, uh, uncut, indicates that it's resistant genotype. Cut, uh, sorry, uncut, it's not resistant. Cut, it indicates that it is a resistant genotype. Once the results have been compiled, they'll be sent to your local field consultant, who will then distribute them to you. I re I'm really excited about this project as I think it has the potential to greatly improve our fungicide programs, as well as provide a lot of valuable information to the researchers about Cercospor fungicide resistance. Historically, August has been a time when Cercospor leaf spots have really ramped up in the field, so you still have plenty of time to take advantage of this project, and I would encourage you all to do so. I would like to thank you again for joining us for this virtual field day. If you have any questions, 
I'll be happy to take them at this time, or you can contact me later. Thank you, Daniel. Interesting work. Uh, if there are any questions for Daniel, I know he's gonna be on here for a while, so uh, be sure to post those in the chat box. Uh, we'll keep moving. Uh, next up is Brian Levine. Brian is uh, working in Dr. Marisol Cantania's uh, lab, and he's gonna talk some more about uh, nematodes. Brian. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to give everybody a little bit of update and uh, some information on our nematode plots. This um, from this past season, I'm trying to get my screen to share. That's fun. Uh, come on. Uh, come on. All right. Meanwhile, you get, um, can you hear me, Brian? Yeah, go ahead, Marisol. Meanwhile, um, Brian introduces, um, um, get things to get um, the presentation together to share the screen. Um, I want to introduce Brian. My name is Marisol. I'm the applied nematologist. We're doing um, nematode work in many different crops, soybeans, sugar beets, vegetables, um, ornamentals, uh, fruits, etc. And Brian is um, my field technician and postdoc, and he has, um, he's conducting most of the sugar beet trials. I'm very thankful for Brian's expertise and um, agronomic skills. And, um, and he will present some of the results. We have some exciting results. We have, um, we have done um, some compost trials and, and also compared seed treatments. And some of our compost trials that have been most successful have been in other crops or for other nematodes, but we think some of those results apply. Um, and well, I'll let, I'll let uh, Brian take over from there. I can see your screen, Brian. Okay, you can see my nematodes? Okay. No, I don't see your nematodes. I see a screen that says sugar beet cyst nematode update, you know, like well, that. That's what I'm trying to share. So very good, then I'll just proceed ahead. Yes, just proceed. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, so sugar beet cyst nematode, as Daniel alluded to a little bit earlier and, and showed us some nice pictures, um, you will see the nematodes as very small white dots on uh, some roots. And what you can get uh, at times is almost a furry or a hairy uh, beet, which is going to affect your tear if you get enough nematodes uh, present in the soil. But again, they're just small fine dots. As those cysts age, they'll turn brown. So if you look later in the season, you, you may not see the bright white cysts. Uh, they'll go to a yellow and then almost a brown. Um, but the eggs are inside that. The cyst is actually the female body of the nematode and it's gonna protect those eggs for eight, 10, maybe even more years. So uh, rotating away from uh, sugar beets would have to be a very long period of time to totally eliminate nematodes in your soil. And like Daniel's field um, shot showed that sometimes you'll see almost what looks more like a nutrient deficiency. The plants are yellowing, uh, uh, off green color, uh, stunted leaf. And if you think about it, the nematodes are affecting root development and if roots can't develop properly, you're gonna have less nutrient and water uptake. So those are would be fairly typical symptoms. Um, back in 2012, Michigan Sugar did a survey and on this map, you'll see the, the red dots are where beet cyst nematodes were confirmed uh, up into the thumb and uh, a few other areas of Michigan. But this was back in 2012 and 2013, uh, so that likely the, the area that is infected or infested with uh, beet cyst nematode has increased from that period of time as we look at larger fields, larger equipment, uh, fewer growers. And if you're not sanitizing your equipment between fields, the potential to move beets this nematode um, or any nematode increases. In some of the recent work we've done, uh, we've looked at some 
foliar applications as well as some inferro applications. And then this is a study, uh, two year average, where compared to the untreated control for raw white sugar, we saw a nice improvement uh, from the use of propulsive planting as well as uh, foliar memento and destiny. So there's some options as uh, systemic insecticides do have an effect on nematodes, which are feeding on the roots, so that if you happen to have a susceptible variety, uh, well, and even on some of the resistant varieties, as we call them, it's not that the nematodes don't develop on those beets, it's that the beets are able to yield and grow well in the presence of nematodes. So some of these um, types of treatments may actually benefit you in the long run for not increasing the nematode populations. Uh, another product that's shown some interesting promise, uh, not yet labeled, is an old product, uh, abomectin, uh, but it's been reformulated by a company called Vive into a product called Laralan. And uh, in that product, at the lower rate that we tested, we saw a nice improvement in raw white sugar yield. Of, um, and this is uh, two years in a row, um, but this was the one year where we had statistically significant yield increases. And with field plots to get statistically significant um, yield data sometimes with beets that tend to be a little bit variable for their yield numbers. Uh, this was really quite impressive. We've also looked at some more cultural practices as well as some other products. Um, in this, you'll see the control plots yielded about 9,000 pounds of raw white sugar, uh, where we had used Defender oilseed radish as a cover crop the preceding season. Uh, we were able to move that up to uh, closer to 93. 100 pounds, um, the use of Nimitz, um, either fall or spring applied with or without oilseed radish didn't do quite as well, uh, but again, Nimitz fall applied um, or um, spring applied at a lower rate uh, did improve, improve um, sugar production compared to the untreated control. And um, this year, uh, we're looking at a couple different options. And sorry, this is a little bit busy, but I wanted to show you everything that we're looking at in the grower uh, field trial we had this year. We're looking at a starter fertilizer application. Uh, now the Averland or Abamectin, again, at the two rates with and without fertilizer. So you'd be looking at adding it to your inferro applications if you're using a starter fertilizer, or possibly if you're not using that, um, it could go by itself. Um, but the lower rates are, uh, looking good, uh, very little difference, and this is plant bigger at uh, a July 9th rating. And we looked at a product uh, from a company called um, Sure or Sure Crop. They've got a product called Plenty Sweet that they've seen some nice advancements, uh, nematode work. Um, again, nothing real, nothing statistically different um, from the untreated control. And again, we're looking at um, our Movento Destiny combinations uh, that we've seen some improvements in the past. So they're all looking pretty good. I was just out to the plots last week. We're starting to see a little bit of separation, um, but there is some rep to rep variability. So I think we're gonna need to wait till we get to the, the fall yield results to see what comes from that. And uh, but the long-term or some management options, the more length we can put in between growing beets uh, will improve or reduce your nematode populations if you can do that. If you do know you've got nematodes, your best option is your resistant or tolerant seed varieties. Uh, also adding a cover crop like the oilseed radish and there are specific varieties of oilseed radish uh, that you need to look for. It's not just an oilseed radish in order to achieve um, this nematode suppression. And again, if you know you've got nematodes in one field but not the others. If you can sanitize um, or pressure wash your equipment or even your boots and shoes um, as you move between fields will help minimize getting those nematodes in your clean fields. Um, weed management is also important as uh, beet cyst nematode has a number of weed species that it can use as alternative hosts uh, for reproduction. So not only in the year that you're growing beets but in any following crops if you've got um, like wheat fallow that you're just letting go weedy, you may actually get nematode uh, reproduction in, in that fallow period uh, off the weeds. So weed control again, and your part of your sugar beet production is very important. Um, again, we're looking at some seed treatments, some pre-plant and in furrow applications. So there are a few possibilities. Um, and 
if you take all of these into consideration, hopefully we can maintain and uh, improve our nematode um, production well into the future. Uh, we do have a new article coming out in um, the fall summer or summer fall edition of the New Beat magazine for Michigan Sugar. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, all these folks for helping fund and um, work with us in our research. And we will be looking to do a, uh, a cooperation with Michigan Sugar, a survey of farmers fields who may believe they've got beet cyst nematode, uh, work with your agronomist to get us a soil sample this fall. And uh, we'll either you know, confirm that there is or isn't beet cyst nematode in those fields so we can update that map uh, that I showed you from back in 2012, 2013. With that, I'd be welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you, Brian. There, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, first one was, uh, what seeding rate did you use when you grew Defender cover crop? Did it winter kill in your trials? Um, that was before my time uh, working here at Michigan State with Marisol. Um, possibly she can answer that, but. Um, um, let me answer that. Um, I do not remember off the bat, the seeding rate, but it was the standard seeding rate used by Michigan Sugar. Michigan Sugar has a few varieties of oilseed radishes that they're using to control nematodes. And in our trials, it does shows that it does help. And of course, there's already a lot of research, especially in Germany. These um, trap crops were pretty much developed in, in, in Germany. And and um, there's research in the U.S. and in Germany showing that they are effective, and we did show that the, this that, that is the case. And for the seeding rate, um, Michigan Sugar would be the one that has um, more information about that. Thank Brian, you, Brian Gruel. Brian Gruel was the one that uh, planted it. Okay. And then the second uh, question is referencing sanitization of equipment. Uh, does, is power washing sufficient to sanitize equipment or does it require something uh, stronger than that? In, in my opinion, uh, power washing, not uh, the nematode to kill. If you do power wash, you're not going to kill everything. But if you do power wash and you wash off all the soil, you will wash off all the nematodes. The intelligent thing to do would be to wash it not in the field that you're trying to protect, you know? So otherwise, because power washing would not kill them, but it would effectively remove them. So you would want to wash it away from the field that you're trying to protect. So mainly anything that moves soil will move nematodes. Any harvesting equipment, tillage equipment, you know, pickup truck, anything, your shoes, anything, that moves soil will move nematodes. If it moves a lot of soil, it can move a lot of nematodes. If it moves a little bit of soil, it will move a little bit of nematodes. And then finally, has anyone looked at BCN populations in Ontario? Brian, do you know about that? Uh, I know they've got the more recent survey and I believe they've got a higher number of dots on their map. So I think they've got a higher incidence of beet cyst nematode in Ontario compared to Michigan. But I don't know if that's just because they've looked more or, um, or if they actually have a higher population. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Marisol, I appreciate your comments. And uh, if there are more questions, we'll come back to them. Uh, let's keep moving this morning. Uh, Dr. Jamie Wilbur is with us to talk a little bit about foliar diseases and sugar beets. Dr. Wilbur. Hi, this is Jamie Wilbur and I am the MSU Potato and Sugar Beet Pathologist. Today, one of the graduate students in my program will be helping to give an update on two of our ongoing Cercospora leaf spot research projects. So I'm going to talk with graduate student Alex Hernandez about our inoculum reduction study in sugar beets. 
Alex, can you provide us a general purpose of this study? We are actually trying to find new ways to reduce the cost for leaf spot by preventing the pathogen from overwintering on leaf debris. And what treatments are we testing this year? So the treatments, we first have a plow or tillage treatment um, that's occurring after harvest. Um, we also have a desiccant treatment where uh, we apply desiccant to sugar beets one week before harvest. Um, then we also have a heat treatment. Um, this occurred just before topping at harvest. And then lastly, we have a non-treated control, um, just for a comparison. This is for last year to see um, how they overwinter for this season. Can you describe a little bit more about the burner treatment? How does that actually work? Um, high heat or high temperatures could possibly reduce or prevent overwintering and the survival of Sargospora baticola. Um, the fungus is sensitive to temperatures over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So our propane fueled uh, burner creates an unfavorable environment um, by exceeding this range for a brief period of time. Alex, we're going to go to a video that you took of the burner operating in the field at the end of last year. Can you describe to us what we're seeing in this video? So we start by powering up the burner, um, and then we lower the flame over the beads, and then we heat the beads to about 1,200 to 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. So how are we going to determine whether these treatments are effective at reducing Cercospora leaf spot? First of all, over the winter, I analyzed symptomatic leaves collected at harvest and at three time points after harvest to assess whether the fungi survives in the affected treatments. This year, for six weeks from about June to July, I placed boxes of about four beads of a highly susceptible variety within enclosures in each plot to act as a living spore trap. Uh, I also collected disease ratings every other week um, to assess the differences between the treatments. Um, we also collected soil samples from each treatment area to measure the differences in the amount of pathogen in the soil. We're going to go to some pictures of your field trials. Um, Can you describe to us what we're seeing? Each of our four treatments has four replicates. All are planted with four rows of sugar beets and they have 30 inch spacing. This trial is conducted within 10 foot by 60 foot plots with a 10 foot untreated buffer zone plus 10 foot wheat alleyways um, around the trial to reduce movement of the pathogen between these plots. Within each plot surrounding the living spore traps, is a five foot by 10 foot enclosure. This is made from plastic sheeting and galvanized steel poles. This is also used to further reduce the movement of Cercospora spores from adjacent treatments. Are you seeing any promising results so far? We're actually seeing consistently low uh, spot counts on the burner treated plots compared to the non treated control. Um, I do still have one more week of data to consider before I make any significant claims, but definitely something cool that we're seeing in the field. Thank you, Alex, for sharing your current progress on the inoculum reduction research. To continue, can you tell us a little bit about the second study that we are conducting at the field site this year? So for this trial, we are using sentinel beads. So these um, very sensitive to Cercospora variety and also mechanical spore traps to detect early season Cercospora spores. And when did we begin seeing spores this season? So this season, um, I actually saw spores as soon as I started sampling, so around June. Also something to think about is we are sampling from a field where it was inoculated last year. So we did expect to see spores present very early in the season. Lastly, have you noticed any patterns in the spore observations so far this year? From what I have processed so far, we're seeing some peaks in spore counts. Um, these are occurring about 12 days apart. Um, this could indicate the time for repeating spore production and dispersal throughout the season. I'm still working on counting spores from the season, so there's more information to come to confirm these results. Did you detect spores before you first identified leaf spots in that field? So yes, we actually did see um, elevated spore counts prior to seeing the Cercospora lesions on the plants. Thank you to our student Alex for sharing her research today. 
In summary, early season Cercospora baticula levels were elevated prior to first spot detections. Spore monitoring efforts will further help us to develop and refine decision support tools for improved early season Cercospora leaf spot management. And lastly, Cercospora leaf spot inoculum levels appear to be reduced after heat treatment of the leaves prior to defoliation at harvest. This research is ongoing and we hope to have more information and results for you in the future. Thank you all for joining us. Below is some contact information if there are any questions about the research that we have shared today. Nice job, uh, Dr. Wilbur. Alex, uh, appreciate your comments. I like the approach. The interview was, uh, was good. Um, We'll, we're, we're running a little tight on time, so we'll keep moving. Uh, again, post any questions you might have. We'll do our best to get to them. Uh, next is Dr. Linda Hansen. Uh, Dr. Hansen is going to talk to us about root diseases and sugar beets. Dr. Hansen. Hi, I'm Linda Hansen. I'm a research plant pathologist with the USDA ARS and Michigan State University. Today we're looking at our uh, Rhizoctonia root rot disease nursery. I do a lot of work with soil-borne diseases. What we're doing here is looking at how different varieties respond to the disease. I hope you never see this in your field, but we have a very susceptible variety with a lot of depth compared to one where we're still seeing a lot of green tissue. A couple of things you look for in the foliage with Rhizoctonia. When it collapses, it's very flat to the ground, usually particularly on these older leaves. And when once they collapse, they stay collapsed. They don't perk back up. You also look for this very dark coloration near the crown of the beets. When you have that, it's Rhizoctonia. Well, severe Rhizoctonia root rot will often show foliar symptoms. When it's milder, you may see a beet that looks quite healthy and have to dig it up. It, particularly if you have some neighboring beets that are looking bad. What we look for for Rhizoctonia is a very dark, dry rot, often with some cracking as it gets worse. The rot will be very shallow with a clear, very dark dry, and then the white healthy tissue, a sharp demarcation between the two. You can see there's a lot of root affected by it here. For soil-borne diseases, Rhizoctonia is our number one problem in Michigan, but we do have a number of other soil-borne diseases. One that we're seeing an increasing problem is Fusarium, which can cause a wilt or root rot. In the foliage, you tend to see yellowing, particularly between the veins, with the veins themselves staying green until the plant collapses. The leaves will wilt, particularly in the heat of the day, but can perk up overnight or if you have a rain. So you can see how they're drooping down as opposed to the flat collapse you see with Rhizoctonia. Rhizoctonia and Fusarium can work together you will have increased damage when you have both pathogens in your field. One of the big differences between Fusarium and Rhizoctonia is, well, with Rhizoctonia, you see a typical nice, healthy white root all the way through. With Fusarium, you see these dark uh, bands where your vascular tissue is. The Fusarium is blocking the vascular tissue in interrupting uptake of water and nutrients, and that's what causes a lot of your damage with that disease. One of the big characteristics of Rhizoctonia is how flat the leaves collapse. Even if you don't see the discoloration, you can see how these are laid right down on the ground. That can be told from a Phanomyces because a Phanomyces will droop. You can see how these are kind of arching down rather than lying fat, flat on the ground. And if you look at this in the early morning, many of those will have perked up and be standing up. That will not happen with Rhizoctonia. A Phanomyces is still a problem in the area, though most of our varieties that are available have good resistance. Well, we should, looked at some of the above ground symptoms, the most important things are what you see below ground. This is a beet with Rhizoctonia. You can see the Rhizoctonia is very dark, very dry. It won't penetrate deep until you've had some of this type of cracking. You can see cracking here on the surface. And 
it's very dark and dry on the surface as well. A Phanomyces, on the other hand, is wet and rather yellow. You will see brown rot and then this yellow on the edges. When it dries out, you will start to see this kind of scarring on the surface. One of the other diseases we look for is bacterial vascular necrosis. This isn't a very common disease in the area, but in particular, particularly in hot, dry conditions or drought, we can see some of it. You will see a collapse of leaves and just uh, the root will turn dark. And one of the biggest differences between rhizoctonia is where rhizoctonia you tend to see here at the base of the leaf turning dark. With bacterial vascular necrosis, you'll see dark discoloration first up on the blade, moving down and getting into your crown. The disease can cause losses both in the field and in storage. So if you have a lot of bacterial ne vascular necrosis, you don't want to put that into your long-term storage. Most of these same pathogens can also cause seedling disease. We do screen for seedling disease, but something that's very important to remember is that seedling resistance and adult plant resistance to these diseases are separate things. Most of the material we have that's commercially available with adult plant rhizoctonia resistance does not have seedling resistance. So you need to protect the plants from when they're planted till they're at least at the four to six leaf stage with other methods. Similarly, fusarium, most of the resistance is in the adult plant. There is some seedling, but it's not necessarily that those that are adult will have it. For Phanomyces, we do know about seedling and adult plant resistance, and they are usually related. So if you get resistance to one, you should be getting resistance to both. For the seedling diseases, symptoms also vary, though they're hard to tell apart. This one is, these are ones you particularly need to send to diagnostics. A Phanomyces, when it's early, will be wet, and as it gets mature, you will get these almost black thread-like areas of the root. Those are considered one of the most diagnostic characters of Aphanomyces in seedlings. Rhizoctonia, your rod is usually right around the soil line. It will be dry and dark, and you can have collapse of the leaves, though the root may remain intact. For fusarium, you tend to get more of a light brown coloration of your seedlings, and they will tend to have a lot of wilt. That can affect the entire root or for, uh, and particularly the vascular system. One of the big things we do in disease nurseries, as well as screening commercial varieties, we also look at older varieties, wild beets, and breeding lines. You can, some of these you can see are quite different than our normal sugar beets, like this one, an old variety with red leaves. And some look more like typical sugar beets, but may have some different leaf shapes. We also look for other diseases. While rhizoctonia is our main focus in this, we also want to see if other diseases might be a problem. For example, Michigan is having a big problem with alternaria, and this variety is having a lot of alternaria. You can see this dark spotting on the leaf. We would not want to introduce a, such a susceptible variety for alternaria into Michigan's growing area. However, the breeders may be able to get some of the rhizoctonia resistance and breed out some of this alternaria, but we need to screen to see where we are. We don't only look at diseases in our disease nurseries, we also look at agronomic characters. For example, we don't want beets that bolt or flower very easily in the Michigan conditions. You can see this one has a number of flower stalks, including this one with a lot of flowers developing on it already, and it was planted this spring. That's not desirable as it uses a lot of sugar when it starts to produce flowers. When we're looking at disease nurseries, we inoculate with particular pathogens to know what's present. In your own fields, I've shown you some of the characteristics we look for for some of the soil-borne diseases, but to really be sure what you have, you need to actually ha send some in for diagnostics, either at a diagnostic clinic or with a specialist. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. I appreciate your comments. Um, that concludes our presentations. I think we've got a few questions in the chat box and I'm gonna scroll backwards a little bit where a conversation was taking place about uh, horseweed and, and Dr. Sprague, would you care to just comment on that briefly? 
Uh, the, I think the question was in reference to tillage in helping manage horseweed. Sure. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Joe. One of the questions that uh, we're seeing a lot of is, you know, can tillage or some of these other things help in managing horseweed? One of the things that we do see is that horseweed can come up in the fall, early in the spring, but it continues throughout the season. Uh, we do know that horseweed seeds are really small, so if you can bury that seed, that does help reduce those numbers. So that's one way that we can um, help manage it a little bit. It doesn't completely take care of all those ones that come up later in the season, but uh, tillage is better than like a stale seed bed or no-till uh, where they can get establishment. But again, we've got that late emerging stuff, so um, that's one of the issues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, Daniel Bublitz, you had a, you just wanted to add a little bit to the uh, conversation about uh, BCN, if I believe. Yeah, BCN in Ontario, particularly. Right. So a couple, uh, well, and it's back up to Brian posted a comment about the uh, seeding rate that they used in that trial that they talked about. So it was 25 pounds per acre, which is a little bit higher than the typical cover crop seeding rate. But the idea is that you really want to saturate the ground with those roots, so you really encourage nematodes as much as possible in that situation, because that'll help to, to reduce the population as much as possible. So then one other comment I wanted to make too is as far as nematodes in Ontario, at this point they've done extensive screening over there for nematodes, and they have not found sugar beets as nematode yet. So just wanted to make that quick comment. All right, appreciate that. Um... We are, we are going to have uh, all the presentations uh, in the recording. It's going to be available a little bit later. Uh, I don't know if that'll be available yet today, but soon. So uh, everyone will be able to scroll to their spot in, in the video uh, to get any other questions answered or repeated. Um, survey. We're going to have a, we're going to post a survey and when you complete that, you'll get the information uh, for, uh, here it is, the survey link in your uh, results or in the chat box, so you'll be able to get your uh, credits once you fill out that survey. Um, I think that about covers where we're at today. We're, we're almost on time. I, again, appreciate everyone's presentation. Pre appreciate everyone getting up early and signing on this morning. Uh, during this uh, time of this pandemic, we, uh, we certainly are getting used to this new way of doing business. So enjoy your day, be safe, and uh, go green. Thanks, Joe.